Okay, so this is the last of my three lectures. Um, I'm going to continue a bit on the previous one that I hadn't finished completely. And then um, I was asked also to talk about virtual observatory. Um, so I'll say, I'll end my today's lecture with that. Just as a reminder, what we're talking about is this type of data that we want to publish. No, it's about uh, simulation data, um, particles, friends of friends groups, galaxies, all kinds of things that are all very much interrelated. Um, because of that reason, we put this in a database because databases are good at um, storing relations and allowing you to query them. So last was about, last session was mainly about what a database is, what it looks like, how you query it. Um, so we have tables with columns and rows. Um, we talked about normalization, that different tables are related to each other. And we talked then about, uh, like galaxies are here in subhalos that are in friends or friends groups. So there's all kinds of one-to-many relationships. And this normalization makes sure that you lose redundancy, um, that you don't need as much disk space to store all your stuff, you're more flexible. And this then allows us to write queries like this, where we find the conditional luminosity function uh, for simulated galaxies, semi-analytic galaxies, inside of friends or friends groups at different redshifts and um, re returning results like this. So these, as we said before, these SQL queries, the nice part of it is that you don't need to know anything about any file format or storage. You need to know about this standard relational model and you don't have to write your I.O. routines. You don't have to do any looping. The database will hopefully take care of that in an efficient manner. Um, so we'll start writing many of these hopefully this afternoon in the hands-on session. Um, there will be challenges mainly where I'll ask what is there are some of these 20 questions that we had. I'll ask you to translate those into SQL. So the database that we'll be looking at this afternoon and that we have here locally is uh, the a version or a mirror of the so-called millennium database, which was a small version of the full millennium. Um, so it has the main structure, all the relations are there, the tables look very similar, if not exactly the same, uh, but it's smaller and so queries will actually return quicker. Hopefully, especially now that we have solid state disks here. Um, okay, so one of the, we had all kinds of motivation for the data model. These are the kind of questions that we'll hopefully be going through this afternoon. So this is based on this uh, design approach by Alex and Jim Gray. Ask science questions, translate them, or allow, and create a data model that allows you to um, ask these questions in a relatively straightforward way in SQL. Okay, so what I didn't get to last um, week, last Friday, was to come up with some special design features that actually are there to answer some of these questions. Now, it's not just, okay, we have tables and we put things in tables, but you want to do something with them. You want to design your tables and the relationships to be able to answer such questions. So there's a couple of things that we've done specially, and some of these tricks or techniques you might also use in your own, if at some point you want to start publishing your own database. And so that's why I discussed them at some length. Um, so one has to do with a special way in which we uh, define identifiers for the individual objects. Uh, there are some tricks that you can do that make it somewhat more efficient, somewhat easier to handle, manage. Then there is something special if you want to ask questions about the environment. Um, we talked a lot also about the merger trees already. How do we store those? You need some special technique. And then in principle, since we have 3D data, you also want to ask questions about things being nearby in space. That is, um, again, not an, a trivial thing to, to do. It's trivial to ask, but not to support in a way that is that performs well. And Thomas will actually talk about that aspect, I think, in the next, well, later today. So I won't handle the, uh, deal with that here. Also because the techniques that he will s suggest are actually not supported in a Postgres database. Okay, so first, identifiers. Um, so for every object, every galaxy, subhalo, particle, friends of friends group that we store in the database, we assign an identifier, a unique number that allows you to look it up quickly. And that is, for example, also used if you say this subhalo is in that fourth group, that the foreign key that you use from the subhalo table to the fourth table has that same identifier in it. Um, so 
there are lots of approaches how to assign identifiers. You could just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We put some extra structure in here to encapsulate some extra information. That's not necessarily the proposed thing. Some people say you should just have random identifiers. That there should not be any knowledge in there. Um, for us, it's not so much of a problem. That's generally for databases where you actually keep updating the database, keep adding new rows. You might want to have a, an alternative mechanism. In our case, identifiers are generated by the people writing the codes. So actually, one of the things that we want to do end of this week, in the last one, is that to try to get some of the, the Galaxy catalogs that you'll be creating with Darren, see if we can store them in your database, and then write queries to actually do the comparison. Maybe write those queries that can show that your model is the best and wins you the iTunes, what is it, voucher. So in our case, what we've done, for example, is that uh, we have a database uh, that con contains about one, one billion rows. Sometimes you want to scan through this database, um, and scanning is slow. We have, a, in our original web application, we actually have a, a finite timeout. If your query takes longer than seven minutes, we time you out. So some queries will require you to just scan through a complete database. Now the indexes that I talked about before may not always work. So the scanning for some of our tables with our system, which is not the, the most performant, may take 10, 50 minutes. So what you would need to do is you, you cannot scan through the whole table. It will time out. So therefore what we have is a, a form of uh, a format that we've given to our identifiers that allows you to cut this up in blocks. I mean, so, sorry. So here we have, for example, a halo ID. Every of our halos, all our files, original snapshot files for the millennium were subdivided, or the, the whole snapshots were subdivided in 512 files, each corresponding to roughly a cubic subvolume, eight by eight by eight of the whole box. So that gives a file number. So all the halos that we have, all the halo trees, are basically come from a halo in a particular file at redshift zero. So this assigns a file number to the halo ID. Uh, all the trees, all the halos in a given merger tree are all in the same file. And so what we've done is we actually in a file, the, 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 the data were ordered by tree. So all the halos in a given tree were consecutive. And so we've done that also in our database. And so we'll come up with some other specific indexing that I'll, I'll mention later. But so we have something where we multiply the file number by uh, 10 to the 12. We use long integers, so integer star 8 for our, our are identifiers generally. So now we have 10 to the 12 numbers within the file. We don't have that many halos. We then have not more than 100,000 trees per file. So we actually give a ranking to the tree as well. And so then we actually assign IDs to halos where they are in a tree. I'll talk about that later. So what this now says is that all halos in a particular tree, they all have the same prefix to their identifier. Now we order all our, our tables generally by these identifiers. And what this now means is that you actually have blocks uh, in your table where first you have all the halos in a particular file and then inside of that in a particular tree. So if you want to walk through this, um, this file, say in steps of, uh, in the, through this table, if you happen to have to walk through that completely, then you might do this in chunks where you say, okay, I just want to have everything where the ID is between file number one times 10 to the 12 and file number two times 10 to the 12. So, or as an example here, so here this colon F1 might be a number between zero and 511. And then what I say is I want to have all the halos between this number, say one, two, three times 10 to the uh, 12. And then maybe I, may, I want to walk through the table in strides of uh, maybe 10 files at a time, so I must make 50 steps. So um, this, the database can do very quickly, you know, because our table is ordered by Halo ID, and the database knows about this, the database engine, and so when you say, I want to go where Halo ID is one to three times 10 to the 12, it can very quickly in logarithmic time look that up. Then everything else is sequential after that, so then it can just scan a complete block, and that is all very fast. And so now you can actually step through this uh, in a controlled manner in these kind of strides. So this happens to be a very useful feature for us. And so most of the queries of questions that I have from users is that my queries time out. And sometimes there's nothing to do about that. I could give them a longer timeout time, like 30 minutes or something, but 
as soon as I started doing that, and people said, oh, my query is wrong, and now I have to wait 30 minutes for it to finish. So therefore, we had, that's where the seven minutes came from. We have a better system now, but this is still a very useful feature. Also to have some random subsets. So some of the subsets that we want to have are really, give me just a sub-volume of the whole box. And so if you have that, this is a very simple way to do that. Uh, another kind of identifier is where you have these parent-child relationships. So um, first of all, so for example, we have sub-halos in friends or friends groups. And not in all our tables, but say in the Millennium 2 tables, where we have actually, that we have an identifier of each subhalo that says, that uh, contains as a prefix the ID of the friends or friends group it is in. So again, if I now start ordering it, and so then within the friends or friends group, we then have a, a ranking of all the subhalos in this friends or friends group. So this allows me to very quickly go and get all the subhalos in the friends or friends group. Again, it puts some kind of an ordering in your table, in your subhalo table, that allows you to very quickly find things that are generally of use. No, I very often want to ask for a given friends of friends group or group of friends of friends group, gives me all the subhalos. And so this is now a fast way to do that. So these are just some tricks that you can do. And so we have something similar with particles, uh, again, in one of our tables where every particle knows the subhalo it's in and the friends of friends group it's in. And now if we order by that kind of an ID, then you can ask very quickly, give me all the particles in the friends of friends group and even in the subhalo that it belongs to. Um, okay, so those are, this is a, a rather technical issue, but it's, it's useful to, to know. So another thing is that we want to represent the environment somehow. So in our list of questions, a couple of them are, I would like to know the multiplicity function of galaxies in voids or galaxies in high density regions. Um, now you can do that in a more sophisticated way and um, we're trying to work on things like that. But a very simplistic way that we had is to actually come up with a density field. So we, we take, the because we don't have for the millennium, for example, the dark matter particles themselves in the database. I mean, that was, would be too big for us, it's about 20 terabytes and our, our database is not that big. But so what we can do is we can represent the dark matter density field simply by putting it on a grid. So say for the millennium, we've put the density field on a 256 cubed grid um, with a cloud and cell interpolation. And now what we've also done is then we took that density field and then have smoothed it with a Gaussian kernel on different radii. Uh, to an, well, the, the cell themselves are somewhat less than two megaparsec, but so we have smoothing at two and a half, five, and 10 megaparsec. Now, the way this is represented in the database is simply that for each cell, in the field, each of the 256 cube cells, we have all these values. We have the original cloud and cell density. It's really actually counts in cell. And then the, uh, the, these smooth versions of it. So now the other thing is that every object knows the grid cell it's in. So each object has a position, of course, x, y, z. But we add an extra column uh, that is an index into this cell, into this density field. And for this index, we actually don't use just ix, iy, iz, which we could have done. That would have been three columns. We use um, an index based on a, a space filling curves, in this case, a piano Hilbert curve. That actually, Tamas will come to talk about somewhat more. So this is a unique index that uh, allows you to, to point to a cell in this 256 cubed disk. So what this now means is that if for a given object, I know it's pH key, as we call it, then I can go to the density field and look up for example, what is its value of the density field at that position, smooth at 10 megaparsec? So now you could start asking, this is an, a rough approximation of the real environment. No, it won't say I'm in a filament or in a cluster. So just say the, the density smooth at a certain radius has a particular value. So this is actually the, the table with that field in it. Forget the first three columns. So there's a snapshot and a pH key, and together they are a unique combination because at each snapshot we have such a density field, then we have this cloud and cell, and, and actually there's also weird smoothings like 1.25 megaparts, because it's of course not really sampled well with our grid. Um, okay, so what you can then do is, for example, first of all, uh, this allows you also to, uh, to look at the density field somewhere. I think Alex in the paper and Mark Nairik and others have actually used this, this data. But so here you can just query, this is 
the, the, ta the database in our full Millennium um, database. Uh, and this is the name, Millennium Field. So I can say, give me, this is one of the, uh, give me the snapshots, the, again, a, a kind of binning as I showed you last time, if I want to do a histogram. What I want to do here is a histogram of the density field at different redshifts. So this query will then give me this result, where the green line is the density field. So this is rho. This is really the overdensity. So it's in units of the average density. So one would be the average density. This is the number of cells with a certain density. So this is rho from 0 to 30 or something. The green line is z equals 3, 2, 1, and 0. So you see that higher density cell starts growing. Oh, there you've got more and more high density cells, as you might expect. At the early time, it's still pretty Gaussian. I mean, this is logarithmic here. Um, so that's one thing. So you can just look at the density field itself, how it evolves. Uh, but now you can also start doing this kind of environment questions. Now, what I would like to say is I want to know something about friends of friends, the, the masses of friends of friends clusters in areas defined by here, um, G5, so the, the, so the density field smooth at 5 megaparsec. Um, and I want to see what are, what's the influence of the environment on my mass multiplicity function of the friends of friends group. So I've got my field here, and I've got my friends of friends group here. So again, in the Millennium simulation, the friends of friends table is in a separate database called mField. This is a lot, slightly different syntax than you'll be using in, in Postgres, where there will be one dot missing, basically. Um, so what I'm looking for is that the friends of friends snap num and PA key should be the same as that of the field. So the PA key just says, okay, now I want for each friends of friends group, I want to find the, the cell um, with the, the same index. And now I'm only looking at fields, so I constrain the fields to have a value where this G5 is close to the mean. So it's between, in this case, 1 and 1.1. 1 .1. uh, so now I only get friends of friends group in such areas where this is where the, it's roughly the mean density. Um, then again, I do this kind of a binning in logarithmic bins. So this is the, the f uh, on the mass of the, uh, the friends of friends group in bins of about 0.1 dex. And I can now do the same for other values of G5. I could have done all of this in one go with another group by. But so I also take half the, the mean density, two times and five times the mean density. What you then get is something like this. So this is just a result of a query. Uh, this line here is, the black line is the average mass multiplicity function. So this is logarithm of the number of particles. This is the number of halos that you have in these bins. So this is the overall. So if I don't put any restrictions on, this one is in the low density region. So you see you have way fewer high mass um, friends of friends group. This is uh, in roughly the average density. This is two times the average. This is five times the average. So you see it starts peaking, but then there is always this cutoff. I mean, if the mass becomes too big, then actually it will have an influence on the overdensity. So there's some kind of a constraint there. So again, this is a simplistic way to come up with an environment, but it's, it's very useful. I'll actually be having one of the, the more challenging questions will be based on this. Okay, so then for us, a very important part was how to do evolution, how to trace back the history of halos and galaxies, how, uh, how this goes. And this is, as I showed you before, this happens in these merger trees. So here are all the particles that at some point end up in the main uh, halo, uh, in one particular main halo. They're color-coded by the halo they start up. These are the, trail, the tracks in time. Now that I show all the particles at all time steps. And so these are the tracks of the underlying dark matter halos. So we'd like to f allow you to follow these kind of structures in the database as well. So what it means is that we have to somehow store tree structures in a database. No? The tree is always that we have a couple of subhalos that have one, a descendant, and some of them actually merge together. So generally, if you work with tree data structures in your code, you use some kind of recursion. Um, so recursion is a bit supported in some databases, not all yet. Um, but it's not very efficient, and also the type of recursion that we have there is not generally the one we want. And so it's, uh, if you want to ask, say, for example, for a given halo, what are its progenitors at z equals 3, to do that recursively would mean that you have to stroll almost through the whole database, and that's, that's all very inefficient. 
So we came up with a special solution that um, is also implemented, for example, in Peter Baruzzi's uh, Halo catalogs, possibly also in Darren's Galaxy catalogs that I don't know. We'll find out. Um, so what we do is the following trick, or trick, the following technique. Um, so we start with all the halos at z equals zero. That's this line here. Then for each halo, we start walking up. We do a depth first walk through its merger tree. Okay, so we assign to the first halo an ID, say, number one in this case. Then we start walking up the tree, and the, the first halo that we encounter, we give number two. We add one to the previous halo. Then before going to the next one, the, its sibling, we keep going up. That's a depth first order. And so we keep following this, this line. So here's index one, two, three, four. Now we have to go back five, six, seven, eight. Now I have to go back here, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So this is now just a depth first sort of this tree. Um, so these are the identifiers that we're going to assign to our halos. And what we're now also going to assign, because one of the questions that we want is not just for halos at z equals zero, give me all the, the, the halos in its merger tree. No, then what we could have done is give every one of these a pointer to the last halo. And then that's what you could do. But we want to do that at every level. And so what we do is then we assign to each halo an extra pointer, the red line, to the last halo that is in the merger tree below it. Okay, so for one, the last halo in this merger tree is this, number 16. For halo number two, it is this halo, which is number eight. For halo 13, it's number 15 here. For halos here at the leaves, they just point to themselves. Okay, and so now the nice feature of this is that, so for every halo, we have its own ID, and we have the ID of this last progenitor, which we call in our database last progenitor ID. If I now for a given halo, so halo number two, I want to find all the halos in the, mer the merger tree that of all the progenitors that end up in that halo, my SQL query is going to be quite simple because I need to find only all the halos whose ID is between my ID and the ID value of this last progenitor. Okay, so if in this case, um, it would ask, give me all the halos with ID between two and eight. Since it's ordered, as I showed you before, this is actually, all these halos are consecutive on disk. So for the database, it's actually very efficient. You walk first to halo two, then you say, give me now everything between two and eight. And so it just sequentially reads them, and that's it. Um, so this is a very efficient way of actually storing your time evolution. So we've actually added some extra features to it. Um, not in all the tables in our database, but so what in our case uh, with our models is generally case is that one of your progenitors is the most important one. Okay, we call it the first progenitor. It's, it's often generally the most massive one. And so what you want, for example, if this halo, if I want to look at an earlier time step, which halo represents me, this is for me, this halo best there, then uh, the, what we do is we follow this first progenitor ID. So there's basically, I, I go from this one to the most massive, for example. It's, it's not quite as trivial as the most massive sometimes, but, and then here, and here, and here, and here. And so this branch, we call the main branch of a halo. So I have put a line around it. Every halo has such a main branch. So this, well, this one is part of the same main branch. But so this one has this main branch, this one has one. And so what we now also do is we give a pointer to the end of that main branch, so to the leaf on that main branch. So now again, if I only want to follow halos that are on my main branch, which very often in certain queries I want to do, I can again ask that same question. So the kind of queries that you would run are the following. So for example, if I just want to have a complete merger tree, so this is a query that will be able to run against the, the database here in-house. So I want to find for a given halo, halo number zero, it's a, I call here des for descendant, I want to find a complete merger tree. So I basically from, I join the two tables to each other. I select the, the descendant with halo ID is zero. And then from the progenitors, I find the corresponding, ha the, the ones with halo ID between the descendant halo ID, which will be zero and this last progenitor ID, which we don't know what it is right now, which is why we actually have to bring that halo in. 
and then I find the progenitors. And similarly, for the, for the galaxies, we have this as well, and there we also have this main leaf ID, as we call it. So this would give me all the galaxies on the main leaf, on the main branch, I'm sorry, um, rooted in galaxy ID number zero. So this is going backwards in time, which is straightforward. If you want to go forward in time, you might also want to do that. Have a halo at a, 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 a redshift six. I want to just see where, the, where does it end up. I want to follow its complete track, like as its orbit. So that will keep as an exercise for this afternoon. So what you now get, this is, uh, for example, for the Millennium 2. So this should be 2 here. Um, this is for a particular big halo. So if I run this query, then I get all kinds of parameters. So this is z against time, the z coordinate against time. So this is time going forward. Here you see only the points. All, this, all the progenitors are plotted here. The red line is this main leaf ID. All the other ones are the, so you see that the main leaf actually, or the, sorry, the main branch actually starts at the earliest. So this is not always the case. The first progenitor that you might have, the progenitor at the earliest time, does not necessarily have to be the one on the main branch. But uh, you see, basically, you can see that you start tracking orbits, as you already saw in this original uh, plot that I showed. Um, and then this one is, is the last, so they merge somewhere in here. So here you see just z against y, so this is an orbit in space. I mean, it, we'll sh see in TopCat that you can also do it 3D, so you can see the orbits there also in 3D, you can rotate them. So these are pure spatial orbits, this is just z against time. Um, what you can now also do is have the mass history, so I also brought back the, the mass of the halo. And so this is now time. These are all the points with their mass distribution, so you see that at some points, the red line again is the main branch and you see that at certain points there are some halos, some progenitors that are even more massive. But most of the time you see also that they start losing mass. You know, the, the main branch just gains mass or increases in mass. The others, I mean you don't see the lines here between them of course, the others actually uh, lose mass most of the time. So with some more efforts, mainly not in the query part but in the graphical part, so you can do the same for galaxies, so you can here, uh, I color code the galaxies by the color. The B minus V color. The size is uh, an indication of the stellar mass. And you see that there are some very trivial halos, as I've mentioned before, of many trivial galaxies, that really they, they start and they slowly grow, and they don't ever do much. There are others that have some merging processes. So this here is the main branch, and then other things merge onto this. You see that galaxies generally turn redder as you may expect. And then you have these very complex ones, like brightest cluster galaxies. Okay, so uh, in hopefully this afternoon we'll uh, try to end up with an answering this question. It uh, has to do with the halo assembly bias, which says that old halos are more clustered than new halos. So we'll find a way how to answer that question in SQL. Is this... So what we'll do is that we calculate the formation time for halos and we check the formation time and correlate it with the environment. And so you see that high density uh, areas here on average have halos of a certain mass that form earlier. It's not quite understood why. Okay, so this was basically the end of the, the previous section the, so uh, where we finished with the, the databases. So, uh, I already mentioned last time that if we go back to Matt's categorization of questions, then we've now had simple queries, meaning simple questions, ones that can be answered. Um, we don't talk much about the hard questions. In a certain sense, it's what you're doing here in the hands-on sessions by, if I wanted to run my L Galaxy or my semi-analytics with different parameters, what would I do? In our database, it's not available, but here it's possible by, by you just running the code and then uploading it into the database, which we'll do later this week. But are there any impossible questions for us at the moment? And so again, what would you do there? No, they are questions that are not supported by our data, so you can run them yourself, um, like we'll do. But we can also try and see, okay, maybe somebody else has actually answered this question. Maybe somebody else has the data and the tools available. And so trying an approach to try to answer these impossible questions, according to his categorization, is to try to find it elsewhere. And this brings us then to the last part of my series. 
This is to talk about the virtual observatory. Okay, um, so if you want to use some of these data for data mining, uh, you must first find it and you must then ex be able to access it. Now the good thing is that there's a lot of valuable astronomical data online available. Okay, so uh, there are lots of nice websites. These are SDSS websites, there are NASA websites, there are CDS in Strasbourg, HISARC, etc. All kinds of this ADS, the bigger and smaller ones, and there's also um, simulated ones. And so there's a lot of data available. Uh, th there are some problems with this. But since all this data is available, this is a slide I got from Alex, is in principle, the internet gives you, could serve as a telescope, no kind of virtual telescope. The data is available online, um, generally of lots of parts of the sky. No, the, almost the whole sky is covered. So like the Rosetal Sky Survey, it's in one survey of the whole sky. It has it in many bands, no, from radio through optical and infrared to, to X-ray. Um, lots of the data is available. Supposedly, every after two years, uh, most data becomes public. May not be always the case, but um, so you're you're pretty good in in the, the coverage and everything. It's always there, so it's not just at night you have to go there. Um, and it also contains even truly virtual data. No, not even just the um, we have to, as we've talked about before. We have simulated data there as well. And so it's not just a simple telescope. You can. So this is of the antenna galaxies, you have the optical radio, x-ray, all of that is available and you can try to get that together. So in principle, that is a very nice thing. There are some problems with it, and this is why this virtual observatory uh, effort was invented. So what this virtual observatory aims to do is to make it easy to access this. And um, it does so by trying to standardize access method. It tries to standardize how you publish your data and how you could discover it, how you describe your data, how you can select parts of the data, how you retrieve your data, the data formats, as well as certain tools and value-added services. So the question now is why would you want to standardize this? And in a certain sense, the previous picture with all these slides showed this already. No, all of these are valuable data, but they all have their own interface. You know? So what you would need to do, if you, would need to, if you want to cross-correlate radio and optical and x-ray, you have to go to the radio website, you have to find it first, that there is something there that might be of interest. You have to go to the optical website, you have to go to x-ray, you have to learn all their interfaces, you do, then have to retrieve the data and all of that. So that's basically a big, that, that's the problem. Now, so how do we solve that? Now, of course, in the real world, we have similar kind of problems. Now there's lots of people here that are not all from the same country. No? We're all brought up in our own language. The reason that we can have these meetings is because we all speak the same language. No, it's not quite Esperanto, it's English, but it works well for us. Probably would work better. So what the VO is in a sense trying to do is it's trying to define a kind of Esperanto, let's say English, somewhat more successful, that you would like all these archives to speak. So if these archives would publish their data, and they can still have their pretty website, but if they would also publish their data using a kind of an Esperanto language, so that, and, and I learn how to speak this kind of Esperanto, then I can talk to each archive in the same language. I can ask the same question, potentially. And it's up to them to interpret this. So this is much more efficient than all of us learning all the languages of all of these interfaces. If instead all of us learn this language, and all of them are willing to put in the effort to uh, describe their data, etc., in that language, then that might solve it. That's the idea behind the VO. And it's not a very simple effort. So there are lots of national VO projects that have actually have been set up that are funded to do these kind of things in their country. Um, because, and they are get, uh, organizing themselves in the International Virtual Observatory Alliance, IVOA, that has this uh, goal. So this is a body, like, like uh, the, um, the World Wide Web, W3C, they come up with all kinds of standards for HTML, XML. So IVOA tries to come up with standards for how to publish your data, astronomical data. And it has, so, it's wonderful that it has all these participants. At the same time, 
um, it makes it also very difficult because there's also lots of national interest and, and political questions that have to be resolved. And so it is a best effort. Eff the IVOA itself is not being funded. It's, it all has to go through here. And so it's a difficult effort. So, but uh, nevertheless, I'll, I'll say something about it. It has produced some results that actually will be of use for us as well later. So the, the IVOA is organized using working groups and interest groups. So working groups are the, the ones that actually come up with documents that define standards. Hopefully you as astronomer would hardly ever have to read such documents as software developer or data archive scientist, or um, you may have to if you want to implement them. So there, there are all kinds of working groups. There's something on uh, a well-known standard is called VO table. How do I represent tabular data? It's not good enough to just put a, a CSV file somewhere. You also have to give the uh, information about the metadata, about semantics, what's the meaning of data. There is a so-called data access layer. How do I get that data? There's a registry. How do I find interesting data? There's a working group for applications that actually tries also to have different applications talk to each other. We'll see an example of that later. Data modeling. So if I have data, I need to describe the data, not just the format, but also the meaning. It's a slightly different form of the semantics. There's a VO query language. So how do we query data? We'll see that as how to use web services or maybe the grid. Uh, something about events. There's interest groups. So these are the ones that produce documents, sometimes very complex documents, not easy to read. Um, but um, that are the standards, and then there are interest groups that basically represent, hopefully, the interests of the different communities. Uh, there was once a radio one that has died out a bit, the theory one um, that I'll, I'll say somewhat more about, and then how to do data curation, how to do knowledge discovery. So they talk to the different working groups and try to get them to do something interesting for them as well. So before talking further, I mean, just a warning. I, mean, I, I think the VO has probably made some strategic mistakes in, from certain parts that they say, oh, we'll, within two years, you'll have the, the whole universe at your desktop. Uh, just underestimating the real problem. It's, it's a hard problem. No, there are lots of archives. They do actually have different types of data. They're sometimes very large. If you want to bring them together, um, you have to find the commonalities between them. It's, it's not a, a simple problem. No, in, in business, people are doing this as, uh, is it uh, enterprise information integration, application information integration, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And so it's still not been solved. Um, so so it, it cannot be, it cannot solve all your questions. It cannot always say, okay, in my archive, we have this very specific data. It has to be part of the standard. You just can't do that because then your VO would become the union of all information and then it becomes un unworkable. Uh, on the other hand, you also don't want it to be the, the, the smallest common denominator because then you may not be left with anything more than RA and DEC, and not even that. No? If you have galactic coordinates, it would already not work. Um, but it will, at some point, if you want to do science with these results, you do need to be able to trace back. So I get results from somewhere. I do need to be able to find back uh, where did this data come from. So I need this, have this kind of prominence, provenance. Sorry. And it's just it's, it's hard. It's, there's a lot of politics going on as well. Now, there's been a very successful standard fits for an image, for a flexible image transfer uh, system, I think it's called, um, with, where people are still talking after 30 years after it started. They're still updating the standards, etc. I mean, the basic core is there, but, um, and th as I said, the problems are generally hard. One of the things that you want to do is cross match SDSS, which is here, with two miles, which is here. No, this is, these are very large data sets. How do you bring them together in an efficient manner? So, in my opinion, you should really see this also as part of a research project uh, that we try to figure out what's the best way to do this. Uh, and so solutions that we come up with now are not necessarily ones that will <coughs> actually be the optimal ones. And we have to acknowledge that. Okay, so I'll go through a couple of the, the kinds of standards that are there, particularly because one of them will be useful for us, a couple of them will be useful for us later on. So, there are the data access protocols so protocols are definitions of how to talk to a service. What kind of questions can I ask? How can I ask them? How will it answer me back? Um, so the VO, the VO basically started with lots of simple protocols. So you have a simple cone search, simple image access protocol, simple spectral protocol, spectral access protocol. Um, so basically what they were based on is that you could 
because it was all about images and observations, the nice thing there is that gen uh, the, the most common question that people want to know is, give me everything that you know about this part in the sky. Know all the sources in this circle because that's where I want to go and observe myself. I want to do an observation somewhere there. Give me all the information you have about this already. No, or I know about this source. Please give me all information about that source nearby. So the, the main question that you want to ask there is, there's a position and a radius, for example. Give me all the images overlapping that. Give me all the spectra in there. Give me all the sources in there. So that is very simple to ask. No, conceptually, it's very simple. So sometimes you can something, say something about observ observation time, not just give me observations that you did there, but also at that time, because maybe I have seen a supernova there. Did you actually look there at that time? And do you have a certain wavelength range? I mean, that those actually already uh, part mainly of the, the spectral protocol. Then there are some standard return formats, this VO table that I mentioned before, and, and FITS. So there, there's some recent, uh, some other observational ones. But so this is, in a sense, the, the simplest version of VO's Esperanto. So we have the simple spectrum access protocol where you can give a position and a size, and then you should get back all the spectra in a particular archive. So if you have an, an archive with spectra, then you can say, I implement the simple spectrum access protocol. That means that somebody can send you a question with a position, a size, a band, and a time. For cone search, it's for catalogs of objects. And again, there you give a right ascension and a declination. Here already you see some inconsistency. No? It's a, even on these simple things where they don't use the same, exactly the same syntax. Here the position is RA, deck. Here it is RA and deck separately. I mean, um, this of course is just a web form, but it really represents the underlying uh, HTTP GET that you could send as well. Uh, and then for the simple image access protocol, you can do something more complex. You basically give a position and a size. Position RA, size, defining a rectangle in RA deck space. And then you can say, I want to have all the images that overlap with this re rectangle that contain it, that are contained in it. In all these cases, once you click the button, what you will get back is a VO table. So this is an example of a VO table. Uh, I'll show a blow up later on. It's XML. And so in this case, what it will tell you is that every row in this table um, represents a thing that you were looking for, a spectrum that corresponds to your query or an image or a source. Okay, so in a VO table, its main structure is pretty straightforward. That this is the standard, the, the URL to the standard document. So you produce, producing XML is not so hard. No, that's, even Fortran can do that. Parsing it is generally harder. I don't know if there are Fortran parsers for XML. Maybe there are, but um, there's, of course, standard, lots of libraries that help you with this and the, the more modern languages. But so what you would have is a, a starting tag. I'm, I'm assuming that you're somewhat familiar with XML and otherwise, or HTML. So it's a markup language. So you have something called VO table that then contains one or more resource elements that then contain one or more tables. So you can have multiple tables in one VO table document organized possibly in what they call these resources. If you're familiar with FITS binary tables, the VO table is basically an XML representation of FITS binary tables. So it's roughly the same metadata. And then you define first, when you define a table, you first have to define the metadata. So this is the really important part. Now you do not just, the data is just like an HTML tables, TRTDs. If you just have that, and that there's no meaning. No? You don't know what is intended. So you have to define also what is in the columns. So in the columns, which are here defined as fields, you have a name and a data type, and then some other fields, some other attributes that you can add there. Like uh, there's something called a UCD. This is a part of the semantics working group, some kind of vocabulary of terms that we all understand. Because I can call it RA, you can call it RA J2000, but it might mean the same thing, and that you can do by having this, the same term that identifies the meaning of the concept here. So this is one of the standards, that's one of the earliest standards that was adopted, and it's actually used quite a lot. So the, the use of these standards is that now also, especially something like VU table, lots of tools that can actually read it. No? Just like with FITS, as soon as FITS is a standard, people can write tools that understand FITS. No, they don't have to understand your format and your format. They just need to understand FITS, and now there's an, an incentive for people to put their data in FITS. The same is true in principle with this VO table. 
Um, so this is, of course, already assuming the service that you knew where to find, where to go. You know, this, the, the simple cone search, the simple image access protocol question, you still have to send to a particular service. So how do you find them? So that's another very important part of the IVOA, that there's a registry, a so-called resource registry, which is, in a sense, a database containing entries. And each entry corresponds to a service, a website, or an archive. And you can there also declare that I'm implementing simple cone search. So um, that, that this was one of the early, again, uh, standards that came up with, because it was clearly very important. I mean, if I can't find any of the services, then there's no point in having a VOI. So these registries are important. Again, there are searchable ones. So you can actually go, if at some point you, get a, you could follow the links here, that the VAO has a searchable registry where you can type some search terms and it will give you things. But it particularly comes in its own if you have certain tools that are actually registry aware. So there are lots of these tools now built again for the VAO that understand VAO standards and that can actually send requests to VAO services. So for example, for images, there's Aladdin and there's others. Uh, DS9 doesn't yet query the VO, it, it can handle it, can handle it. But so Aladdin is a tool developed in Strasbourg. For tabular data, Topcat is very good. Um, Spectra data, there's a couple of tools as well. There's uh, also for 3D simulations, there's uh, some tool. So what these tools do is they, some of these tools can actually go out to the registry. And for example, here, this is a, a, a screenshot from Aladdin. You can open up if you play with Aladdin, which we won't do here. But Topcat does the same thing. You can actually go to a registry and ask, give me all the simple image access services. It will give you a whole list of services. So here you have uh, there's the VLA, Sky Survey, there's uh, SDSS is here, there's Tumas, there's somewhere uh, the Roset, all Sky Survey images. So now what you can do is you can check some of these boxes, and then you can actually submit, since all of these implement the simple image access protocol, you can now submit, again from this Aladdin tool, you can give a target, which there can even be the name of a source, but it can be a position, and you can give a radius. And what this tool then does, it will just send out this SIA query to all the services that you've chosen. So instead of you having to do it one by one, now you can, because of this registry and because of this protocol that all of them implement, you can send a query to all of these services at the same time, and then or through this tool. And Topcat does, uh, do, does similar things for tables, as I'll show later. Um, so here, what it will then do is it will actually download, allows you to download, it first will tell you what it has found, and then you can say, okay, now download the corresponding images. So this tool even allows you to then show all the different images. So here you've got a stack of images that all come from the same query. You can do other stuff, you can even then, you can just play with this tool, whatever you want to do. But so all of these are now in, come from one request, and you can start playing with this. So this is one of the, this interoperability that is, uh, that requires there to be standards is one of the, in principle, strong points of the VO. I just want to make it work. So since I've been mainly talking about um, simulations, I'll talk also a little bit about theory, because theory in the VO is actually a hard problem. Uh, it's much harder than observations, you know? and for that reason, and also because there are, there are more observers and theorists, and there's more interest from the observational community for this, Many of the VO offers have concentrated on the, uh, observational data. So, and one reason is also that, in a sense, observations are very simple. Now, the, the observables are straightforward. Photons come in at a certain point of time from a certain direction, and they have a certain energy. And that's it. Now, there's not a lot of information there. Um, so another good thing for observations is that there's a long history of archiving, because people are also interested in old observations, like 80-year-old observations of uh, photographic plates are still interesting for certain people. Now, if they want to see if there was this asteroid uh, that was moving through. Um, and so because of that, all the standards are basically rather observational bias. So these simple standards that we had, they were based on, again, ba these simple observables. No, it was there, the time was not even included, just all the photons or all the sources from this part of the sky. Um, also, another important thing is that if I look at that part of the sky and you look at that part of the sky, we can actually hope to see the same objects. No, they may have changed over time, but generally uh, we think that they are the same objects, and so you can actually try, it makes sense to match SDSS to TUMAS. 
if I run my simulation and you run your simulation independent of me, there's no point in what point by point observation or cross cross matching. So, um, so most of the efforts are in the th uh, are there. So for theory, it's just not as as simple. Those simulations have all kinds of properties. In in Darren's code, you'll be able to calculate 200, uh, 100 properties of galaxies potentially for our dark matter halos, which themselves are already a very specific technical object, you have all kinds of properties. Uh, we have all our merger tree information, we have time evolution of the object. So there's not much standardization and there's no fits for uh, simulations. I mean, yes, you could start using HDF5, but it doesn't mean that you actually know what's in it. No, it's just, it's a container. It's not actually it tells you the meaning of the, the things inside. Much of the archiving has been rather ad hoc. Everybody has their own data, proprietary data formats. So therefore, we don't have a common sky, as I said. We don't have common objects most of the time. There are certain specific experiments where you could do that, but they're the, the exception rather than the rule. And so the data models that you need to describe your data need many more properties. No? They need uh, all kinds of physics. They need to say something about code, potentially. So another thing is also the history of simulations is somewhat less interesting. Well, maybe for historical reasons. But so if you look at what was definitely a very influential simulation by Toomer and Toomer on merging galaxies, it contained a, a couple of hundred points. No? If you these days, I mean, this is already again old, this is seven years old now from the Matteo Springle and Hernquist, they run simulations of merging galaxies where they have hydro, simula hydro dynamics, they have uh, AGNs and all of that kind of feedback, star formation. Would you really want this data again? Maybe just for historical purposes, but not to actually learn something more from it because you can do much better right now and much faster probably than they could then uh, in those days. So therefore, that reason again also goes some other way. So why would you even bother publishing them? So just come up with some reasons here, of course. That, so simulations are interesting, the latest and greatest ones. So sometimes, it's the, many times, it's the only way to which, which we can see processes in action. Now it's the, 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 the best uh, approximation to a laboratory that we have in astrophysics. The um, thing is also that nowadays we have very complex observations. And complex observations require complex models to try to understand them. So now these are very detailed X-ray observations or gas pressure derived from for the coma cluster. So they have all kinds of detailed features. Maybe there's turbulence going on inside of that. I mean, it's just a spherical cow cluster model doesn't really work there. And so there we have our sophisticated. I mean, here they run, the, the, they're very good at this stuff as well, the hydrodynamic simulation. So you have very sophisticated simulations that you might want to, to get access to and to compare to your detailed observations. You might want to calibrate your uh, observation or your analysis techniques against this. So this was this other example that I showed now where uh, from our Millennium Run Observatory where we have a UDF field, uh, you have the real UDF field. So, um, so these are complex models that um, are generally built by people who actually understand simulations really well, who might not be experts in observations, whereas experts in observations are not really experts in setting up the simulations, interpreting them, running them, I mean, yes, you can do this in large collaborations, but not everybody is part of such a large collaboration. Um, I've heard people in, uh, who in South Africa are using the Millennium Run database now because for them it's the only way to get access of these large-scale simulations. So, so it's, it's nice that you can now also bridge the gap in, in specializations in a rather dynamic way. You know, I, if the VO was completely working, then I could go out and find all the simulations that were run here at SDSC or the ones that were run uh, in Garching or in Durham or wherever and, and actually find all that information and hopefully get it also in a form that I can use to interpret my observations. And note also that not all the use cases need really the, the latest and greatest simulations. So as Alex mentioned, that in, in some sense the Millennium has become a reference set even though, as Joel argued, it's not uh, up to date anymore, it has old, cosmolo old cosmologies and all of that, it still has become a reference set so you can compare the analysis that you do to the analysis somebody else did on that same data set. So it's still useful for that as well. 
And then there are some like exposure time calculators, survey design. So I understood yesterday from Andy, the LSST doesn't really need for its simulations the, the very high end, the latest, uh, the latest simulation. So, so in the VO, um, at some point we started an effort to, to see what we could do with theory in the VO, even though it's very hard, as we said before. And so it's, it's not progressed very far, again, also because this whole VO effort is a best effort, is based on best effort. So whoever, whichever uh, national virtual observatory project sends people to the IVOA will have some influence, but many of the people are not paid by an IVOA, so it goes slow. And again, as for simulations, it's, we have now a data model that describes simulations. So if you run a simulation, it won't give you the data, but it allows you to describe how you ran it. It allows you to describe, to describe your code with the parameters, the kind of physics it models, etc. And then it, it allows you to describe the actual simulations using that code by giving, okay, this parameter was set to this value, this to this value, etc. This is more uh, a kind of a registry like way. So you don't, through that model, you don't describe the data itself, you describe the metadata about them. But once we set this up, and, and that really now we have to start setting up some of these kind of databases that implement that, um, then people can start publishing their simulations in some way. There's still no direct retrieval. I mean, data sets are, are very large. So there's a, a new, the continuation effort going on is to come up with a simulation data access layer. How do I access 20 terabytes of data? No. Can we come up with some standard protocol for subsetting that, that I can actually query on only part of the data? How do, we, how do you do that in a world where we don't even know what the properties are in principle that you can subset on? Yes, if it's an embodied simulation, we know a lot. But uh, already if it's uh, an AMR simulation, you get different things back. No? You get some, some way, you get your grid cells back rather than particle positions. But, and we were even pushed into the way of, of having all kinds of different kinds of simulations, not like star formation histories or stellar evolutionary tracks. They should also be able to be described because there's lots of people who want them. So it's all, it's, it's a, somewhat of a, well, the, the world is complex and so therefore uh, the standardization is hard there. But a lot of ad hoc services are always welcome. So we've created a couple like the Millennium Run Database was an, an ad hoc service. No, there was no standard for that yet. Uh, we have some other ones and, and lots of people here have their own services as well. There are two standards that are useful for the VO. One of them is called TAP and one is UWS. And I'll just say a little bit about TAP now because that's the one that we're going to use. So as I said before, this is just a table access protocol. So if this is uh, one of the most recent and one of the more useful protocols, that if I have a database of data, how do I publish this to the VO or to the community? So um, it defines a protocol for a couple of steps. First of how do I know what, how do you tell me what you have in your database? What tables do you have? What columns are in there? What is the meaning of the columns? What relations are there between all the things that we described before? There must be a standard way for describing that. And so there's basically a standard protocol. If you say, I am a tab service, then people can send me a request that says, okay, give me all your, give me your tab schema, as it's called. Give me all the tables that you have in your database. Give me all the columns that you have. It's just, just a standard way, and I send back an XML document that tells you that. And then there's also a standard way of sending queries to my database. Now, we, first of all, we already had to come up with a language to query. And so we've luckily chosen SQL because it's existing. At some point, people were thinking of defining their own query language, but then you would also have to write your own interpretation tools, and all of that is, is very hard. So for SQL, at least, we have a lot of the standard tools available. It's still not trivial. But so there is a language called Astronomy, Astronomy Data Query Language, version 2.0 already, that is basically SQL minus some, some features and plus some other features. And the plus some other features is actually not a problem because that has to be separately implemented and parsed. But many of them you can also just send native SQL. So if you know that this is a SQL Server database or Postgres, then these services should also allow you or could also allow you to just send the basic SQL queries. And that's what we will be playing with later on. Um, there are different ways of sending the queries, either synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous is that you send a query and you wait for the, the result. It comes back. 
asynchronous, you send a query, it's being put on a queue, and you can regularly query, is my job done? That's what we'll be playing with as well. So our Millennium database never had that. It was always synchronous only. And therefore, it's hard. And, and so we didn't really manage very well the jobs you had on, on a queue, so you couldn't kill them, which would have been very useful sometimes. And they, therefore, also, we had this limited timeout. Um, there will be a way that you can also upload some of your data. So if you have your source list, you want to upload it to the SDSS tab services if it's there, and, and then run a query that joins your source list to those tables, that should be possible. And then there are different execution parameters, like that you say, okay, if it takes longer than 30 minutes, kill it. Don't give me back more than 100,000 rows, stuff like that. And then there's a, another way about how to retrieve the results. What's the data format, generally view table. Um, so the example will be what we call ISAC tab. This is what we'll be working with this afternoon and, and Thursday. So this is the URL. Um, I, I won't demo this now. Uh, if you click on this link, then you get all the tables back, etc. You could query just by sending the parameters on the, the URL strings. So you can just attach them. That works here. So here you have the query, select star from millimil, MPA, halo, blah, blah, blah. And I say here that the format that I want to have is a view table. Um, I'll also show how Topcat can actually work this, this uh, view table visualizer, how it can work as a tab interface. So you, it allows you to type in an SQL query, you get the data. After a while back, if you put it on a synchronous job, it will actually check whether the job is done. Um, okay, and as I said, more in the hands-on sessions. Um, okay, so in the hands-on session, this is basically the end. In the hands-on session, this afternoon we're going to get familiar with database access tools and start running queries based on these just to, to see how far we can get with writing interesting SQL. In particular also, it would be interesting to find out how we can use a database so you can actually investigate the data that you're creating with Darren and hopefully we'll, we'll find a way that you can upload it to the database. We're working on that. So that then uh, we'll work on that on, um, on Thursday so that actually with some extra work, so it's not just uploading data in the database, but as I said before, you have to provide the appropriate metadata. That if you provide the metadata, then you could actually publish your data to. Um, yeah, let me just go to. You'll have to log in. I'll send you today. You'll get an email that may become somewhat cryptic where you just get your username and password. That will be the username and password with which you can log into the site and also using a direct Postgres client to the database itself for uploading. So all of you, well, are already, I think, represented here with a name. So there, this is the client that we'll be playing with. So here you sh we show all the schemas that avail are available. So within the database, as I said before, it's the subdivided in schemas. Inside of the schemas, you can put tables. Each of you has a schema named after your username, and when you log in through this PSQL client, you can actually create tables in there and upload data in there. There is a set of special tables in each schema, one called underscore tables, one called underscore columns, where you can actually, if you insert metadata in there, then this tool will actually be able to query that. So this tool will then actually tell people, just like we've done here now for the millimillennium, that there are these tables available. So that would be a way for you to publish your results in principle to the world if we would set up, if we would open up this page after the school, then the results of the school could actually be published using the standard VO protocol with your results in it. Okay, so for my lectures, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So I agree that, that having standardized input output formats are, is wonderful. And then you have to learn one thing. But how do you implement that in all the sites that are already out there? Like, how do you get them to change? 
Well, in principle, you don't want them to change. You want them to add something. Most of the time, that's the case. So, for example, if you already have a database, now you just have to have a service on top of that that talks, that just speaks this language. So you just have to have a, a little translation layer. I mean, I say just. It, it's never just, but that would be the way the way forward. Um, so, because generally you already query a database on the back end. Now, many of the services of the web applications out there, they already did this cone search. I mean, it didn't come out of nowhere. No, for everybody had realized that that is the simplest query and the most interesting query. So they already had something on their web page where you could click a button after you had typed in an RA and a deck and a radius, and it would already do this kind of stuff. So the only thing that you now have to do is to make sure that that button uh, that the, the fields in the HTML have the appropriate name, like RA and deck, so that your service understands that, and that when you click the button, the result comes back in a standardized format. So it's the hardest work anyway is to set up your whole web application already. So if you already have it, it's, it's a, generally a translation. The question is, are you willing to go through the effort? And is it, is it worthwhile? That's the hard question. So I mean, sometimes you can actually tell them and say, look, we have done it, and it was very successful. Like, I mean, that, that, I think SCSS is basically pointing the way. You know, It's been tremendously ex successful. So now people see, oh, if we come up with our project, and like if LSST or DES, if they're not going to publish it like that, then you don't get as much traction. I mean, the, the thousands of uh, papers published with uh, SDSS, I mean, are clearly a hint. It's, it's a, a public interface. Now, it's not VO. That is true. So why people should do it in that particular interface, that's, that's still a harder question. There you can really say, okay, then you're... Like, we have our ROSET archive at MPE. We have the, all the, the images here there, and they get many hits now because it's so easy from within Aladdin to do simple image access protocol queries. Otherwise, people would have had to go to that interface. I'm not saying that this is the, the majority of all the requests, but like with the, the multi-dark database that has Bolshoi in it, they did that because Millennium was successful. So again, not a, quite a VO standard, but soon they will get a TAP service probably from us as well, so then they are VO standard. Well, that's true. If at some point journals would also say, oh, uh, we're not accepting this paper where you describe your data unless we can access to your data and it has to be VO compatible, that would be an, an important stick. But it would be nice to have some carrot as well. Yes, Mike? I think it's struggling. I mean, we had some big discussions with Alex and Tomas and I yesterday as well. I, th I think like the, the UK VO, which was very influential in the beginning of the IVOA, they lost their funding. Uh, a German VO is doing relatively well, but it's very small. It's mainly some people actually doing some work. The French VO is probably the most successful one because they don't ask for much money, but and somehow they have a lot of people who are I mean, they are the biggest contingent at the IVOA meetings. I think it's personalities as well. They have somebody who's really pushing it. it at some point, it has to be sold. No, and, and even if it's not the best product in the world, if you can sell it, potentially. If you can sell it, then it becomes popular. If you can't sell it, now it would be nice if it is a good product and it is sell, sold well. But if it's good and it's not sold, then Alex probably has other... Yeah.
may say that the entity of VO has struggled in some ways, but some of the protocols that people are adopting, yeah. there's only a couple of them, yes. but they are actually spreading out throughout the community, so you can begin to share data. So there has been some success. I mean, these simple protocols, they were particularly done because they were simple to implement, relatively simple. No, so you, you didn't need, you could even, you didn't even need a database if your source catalog is small enough that somebody asks you, R, give me RA, DEC, and this radius, and you just scan through the whole thing. And then if you have, of course, 300 million sources, you want to optimize it, and then it becomes a harder problem, and uh, Thomas will talk about that. But for these simple protocols, I think there are the tools, but it's the next step, and that's, I think, where a lot of the, the problems are now, because now people want to make them very sophisticated. I think there are some nice tools, but I think the most important part is to make it easy to get at the data first from within the platform that you are. And, and the danger would be that if you're focusing on tools and people can only use, like Aladdin as an example, which is popular in France, um, and there they're developing it, um, but not in the rest of the world. And so if you focus too much on use this tool to do it, then that's hard. And it would be nice if it's very easy from within Python to get at that data. But you have to use Python probably somewhat differently. I don't, I'm not an expert in Python, but you will have to ask a question for somewhere, where could I get my data? And then you get an answer, and then you have to react to that. And so there, a GUI kind of environment helps because you, you, it can display the complex information. Um, and, but for, and it's indeed like when we set up the Millennium Database, people didn't necessarily just want to go in and write a query click. They want to write a script. I want to just write a script that deny from IDL goes out, does the query, brings it into IDL, and they can write their plot. Um, and that was IDL, and Py others have done it in Python. No? It's just wget ultimately that you spawn. But that's how we got all our queries. No, we got, I don't know, 13, 14 million individual queries. That is not people clicking a button, obviously. I mean, at some point, it would be a tool that's looking for, for problems. And many tools have been developed like that as well, of course. But somebody <laughs> had an idea, they build it. 
and then people will come because they realize they can do something new which people uh, there's so much science to do now they don't are not necessarily looking for something new they have something to do already Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, th I think the registry first, and then the, the, these, in a sense, metadata queries. So you find a registry to find the potentially interesting information, then you send a standardized query to them. That could be an SQL query if they're, for example, a new standard is called OPSTEP, which is like, these, uh, like a union of these simple image access, simple spectral, simple search, where you can, where people say, okay, n instead of, um, saying this is what I listen to when you get whatever you want. We also, we actually uh, describe our data in a standardized format. And now you can send SQL there. Whether that, that for, not format, a standardized set of columns. You know, like I have an observation in this area of the sky. It is this type of observation, uh, something like that. It's and a form of web search, right? Correct, correct. I mean, in this case, OPSTEP is really metadata still. So it's just, yeah. if you can implement SIA or SSA, then you can implement OPSTEP as well. Um, and so, but, but, but what it means is that first you find the OPSTEP service, then you send the SQL query everywhere. And now you get your potentially interesting data, and then you can see what you want to do with it. Um, but yeah, I think that's the most important part, for sure. And again, sorry, and again, for theory, this is hard. I mean, we we're talking about this, and I think Rick is interested in looking at what YT can do here for the access part, you know, because it knows all kinds of underlying formats already. And so if you now know there's an ENSO simulation, then with YT, if it had the appropriate modules, I could maybe remotely access it, if you have such a, a nice tool set for yeah, that. we are going to build some kind of catalog. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so, the, yeah, so just to, to show off a bit of, of my stuff. I'm allowed to. So this is the a result of the simulation effort where we have built a kind of a registry for simulations. And this is a browser. I mean, the, the problem again here is that if you, we wanted to just describe this and we don't know if this is the final implementation. We probably want to simplify the data model. But so this is something that we may still install here on the system before Wednesday, uh, Thursday so that people can, here you can just browse through, say, all your simulations and at the moment in our database, we don't have that many. Hmm. Sorry, not simulations, simulators. So simulation codes. So the interface is not very pretty. I mean, this interface is completely generated from a data model, and the whole web application is completely generated. But you can query this in principle with SQL or with TAP. Um, but browsing, in this case, is somewhat simpler. Yes. <coughs> you can find it here. You can contact that individual and strike up a collaboration. Yeah. That seems to me to be a low hanging fruit kind of activity. Yeah, when I mentioned this to Volker, for example, he said that he would like to just have a local database like this so he sees what the PhD students are doing if they register. Or particularly if you could actually, in your pipeline code of your simulation, one part would be spit out a module with the metadata of what you've done and it would be uploaded here, then it's queryable. Probably not. I mean, as long as there's no standard for that, then formally you cannot put it in the virtual observatory. 
So if at some point there will be a standard for pipeline processing, like a standard way of calibrating things, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on that, um, then that could be the case. For us, if there's a standard for running semi-analytics on merger trees, then if somebody puts up a merger tree, then there could be a semi-analytic service somewhere else that you could send the merger tree to. But again, that's all very specialized. Now, the, the, the big problem is what are the, the commonalities between all of these services? And if they are there in these pipeline processes, maybe. But uh, I, I'm not an expert on that. Okay, so one thing that is, there is a, a standard way of putting code online, running services. This is called a universal worker service. So you can, it can be described by a parameter and you could start running it. And that's a, a standard way to publish something. There's no, I mean, there's probably not going to be thousands of those things anyway. So it might be there's just a registry that you can browse allows you to do that. The Astro Grid UK actually wanted to set up such a registry and that you could build your own workflows. And then if you publish your service that does semi-analytics, for example, somewhere, then somebody else has a service that produces merger trees and they could be hooked together. But there's still quite some, some way. That was, so the, the, the core node is in principle there. And we have actually a, a semi-analytics. Our L Galaxy's code is online um, and is actually published. It uses, it's, well, it's not published yet in the registry, but it uses this universal worker service interface. Yeah? I guess you would have to store it locally if you can't hold it. I, I, I'm not sure if I... Um, but so who would have the database? So if, if Alex has a database and I query it, the data comes to me, but he has a MyDB and so you can store it there. So this concept of MyDB is, I think, very useful because you have the result. You do most of the analysis near the data. So that's, I think, where you would really want to go. But I'm not sure if that's what's answering your question. Yeah, the same way, I have an analysis. Yes. My analysis uses a significant amount of memory. Yes. And I can only actually work with 100 million objects at a time. And you're going to send me a billion objects. <coughs> so I want to iteratively process. Hmm. I think at some point people talked about that also maybe in the context of, of ADQL. There's certain databases, for example, offer this concept that not just you give the top 10, but also like next 100 million. So that you could, like as, a, as if you had a cursor open, but that is very much um, not a standardized thing at the moment. I, I think that definitely for the very large archives, there are going to be specialized websites that everybody will know about. <laughs> Now, SDSS is not known because it is somewhere visible in Aladdin. Clearly not. Now, the, the cache jobs is there as a specialized service that people use probably more than the rest of the VO together. I, would, I don't know if it's true, but I guess that. Because it's a very valuable data set. And ultimately, that's why people got, come somewhere, because the data is valid. Uh, it's, it's valuable, not just because it's, you can put a checkbox in it in a, a list where it sits next to who knows how old uh, a tiny little data set of three POS plays that have been scanned or something like that. So if I can't iterate, can I <coughs> that depends on your database. Some databases allow you to do a random sampling. In our database, we had that implemented. We have a column with a random number in it, so it makes it simple to do that. Um, SQL Server allows you to do an order by new ID and then take the top 100 million. But of course, that's a rather expensive operation because it ha does have to go through the whole thing. But random sampling is a, would be a useful feature. Again, if we talk about the TAP interface, it's not explicitly supported. It depends on what people do their data model. Tamás? I think we have to stop.